Hello, everybody. So glad to be back together. Very glad that you're with us, whether you are on the Facebook live stream or whether you're with us in person. We're so happy to be back in person this morning. And as we're back in person together, we're very glad to be here. But we want to encourage us to keep uh, safety in mind. Uh, we ask that uh, we wear masks and so that we can be together uh, in person. This morning, as you can tell, we are starting at a new time of 9.30. The reason that we are starting at 9.30 instead of our old 10, 10 is because we are very excited that we are starting our Connect gatherings together at about 10.30. So after the worship service, um, we will uh, let you know when we will start our Connect gathering. It will be at about 10.30. That should be a time together here in the it's going to be time together here where we're just going to be catching up and seeing what the Spirit can do in each other in our lives. And so we're going to have a connect gathering here in person. We're also going to have a connect gathering on Zoom for those that are virtual. We encourage you to do the affirmation ballot survey online. That is in the weekly email. And I also want to I uh, encourage you to check out the, uh, for the families, check out the kids and youth videos I'm starting to release on Thursdays. This morning we want to keep the Delft family and the Bar family in our minds and in our prayers this morning as um, we mourn the loss of Donna and we mourn the loss of Jen, our son. Dear Lord, thank you for the ability to gather together, see our friends this morning. God, we pray um, for the Delft family, we pray for the Bard family, we pray for you to comfort them, we pray um, that they can recover all the families for We pray that um, we know how much the church comes.
Is it the one who is inviting us into a space and life where we live with freedom, with hope, and with joy, no matter what circumstances arise? And that's both hard to imagine and hard to live. Because when things happen, like what happened in the middle of this week, all of our humanity starts to tremble with a sense of fear of what's next. And God invites us into the place where he says, I am your place of refuge. I am your strong tower. I am your power. And it's in that place that we want to both preach into and talk about, but we also want to, in that context, be attentive to what it is that God is speaking to us in this season. During the month of January, we're looking at this topic of clarity. Uh, we're in this uh, five-part series on clarity. Uh, we started last week. Uh, it's primarily centered around this uh, focus on seeing. Uh, so uh, for me, I can do that pretty easily because I can tell you that if I do this, I have no idea who's out there except my wife is uh, sitting beside her. Because um, I can't see much of anything without my glasses on at a distance. But seeing more clearly uh, the ways and purposes of God. So we can look at things and say there are the ways and purposes of man. And they often impinge on us and influence us and impacts in ways that are challenging. But the ways and purposes of God are that which we are, we are we're going to focus on with our new eyes to see. So in the midst of that, we easily get distracted. By our own desires, by our own fears, and our own want for comfort and life of ease. It's our human nature. Uh, a friend of mine often joked about this ever since Satan's developed the easy button. We just want to buy easy buttons for a lot of things. Oh, well, just push the button and make that easy. The only problem is you can't buy it. Because there are many circumstances that are complex and difficult. And it, and it puts you in a place where you're, you're reliant on something transcendent, something bigger than yourself, to be able to walk through the circumstances that, that you face, that we face. And we're in one of those times right now in our nation where there isn't an easy button. If anybody has an easy button, they would have found it. The reality is that we're in a place where we're needing to focus on meaning purposes. And we look at the life of Jesus. And especially the teachings of Jesus, as we see through different lenses, we see the, the, the we see the reality that following Jesus is very different from what our human nature would want to do. We're called to lay down our own agenda. How's that work for us? Laying down our own agenda. We're called to die to ourselves to be, in some ways, like little children with a simple faith that what God has said is true. We walk with that truth, even when it doesn't necessarily feel in our hearts and in our beings what seems right or even what we understand. And we do that walking in simple faith so that we can enter into the kingdom and do the work of the kingdom. We surrender to God's loving discipline and correction so that we can be transformed or made new into the image of His Son, Jesus. This week in a regional prayer gathering uh, with other pastors who resume my uh, once a week regional cluster of interdenominational pastors meet. They do throughout the, the years, but now on Zoom, connecting and, and, and engaging in that content. And one brother shared something that caught my attention in that context and it reminds us of this process of being transformed and, and, and learning. That is, uh, from Acts chapter 1, you don't have to turn here, I'm just going to read for you to, to listen. Again, Luke writing to uh, the, 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 the church and talks about it to the apostles in particular. My former book, the apostles, I wrote about all that Jesus did um, and began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving the instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many witnesses and proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which
which you have heard me speak about, for the for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And his brother just began to talk a little bit about this. He said, Here was Jesus. He taught them for 40 days about the kingdom. This is after he was resurrected from the dead. They had seen a lot of things, they understood things with a different light, but they still didn't get it. Because their question was what? Are you now going to restore the kingdom? They didn't understand what was happening. So now you conquered everything, now you've got to set up your kingdom. And his response was in that context was it is not for you the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But wait for the Holy Spirit. The spirit that comes and dwells within you, within us, the pain of that cross, it transforms, that present spirit transforms our lives and it enables us to walk in a new place. And we're going to talk more about that later on. But I just, a recognition that in that context, even though they had been with Jesus, even though they had watched and seen this, this incredible work of the spirit in that context of God being the God coming and raising him from the dead, they still lack understanding, just like you are right. But they gain greater understanding day by day as they walk in the Spirit. They weren't seeing the fire. They weren't able to see the fire in the light of what's uh, in, in, in that context. The light of what happened this week, where some were going to try to take the nation by force, I keep inviting us to put on the different lenses. What is really happening? What is really going on? And in that context, what does Jesus say to us in that space? You see, Jesus taught a different, a different gospel. You say a different truth, a gospel of humility, of lavish love and grace. And when he was brought before Pilate in John 18, verse 6, he said, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom. Is not of this world. That's the kingdom he talked about literally hundreds of times of that context of the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And he invites us into that place where that kind of kingdom living. We need clarity about what that these days. Is if this kingdom is not of this world, what does it look like? And we need new eyes to see more clearly. That really brings us to the heart of the series. On clarity. And that heart is the incredible love of God that always will keep coming back to you in the context of these messages. That it's rooted not in doing more, doing better, performing, it is in knowing the love of God. And out of that love, surrender to a God who transforms us from the inside out. In John 3, and I'm I, John 3.16, most of us memorize at some point in our life, but we probably didn't memorize it this way. This is out of the passion, I call it the passion paraphrase, I call it the passion translation, but it's a paraphrase. For this is how much God loved the world. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his one only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send the son to the world to judge and condemn the world. But to be a savior and rescue it. This is how much God loves. As you see, my, my hands aren't big enough. Even if they were just stretching and hands, kept on stretching and stretching, they wouldn't be enough. Because the love is so expansive, so big. And it's that heart of understanding that God's invited us into the bigness, the greatness. We often say this to little children, you know, grandkids now, so big, you know, and we're already trying to see of something that's transcendent, that's bigger than the world to us. But God is so big, so much of that love. And in that grasping how much God really loves us, but also understanding that the poor was not the judge or condemn us, 
but to be our Savior, our rescuer. It's going to be dope when I remember seeing the, the uh, sight and sound rendition of Jesus and the whole theme of that was rescuing. Being rescued so that we can rescue others. But that means a change of heart, that means a change of agenda, that means a change of what is going on in this huge world. What does that look like? How is that translated into a piece of today's content? What does God's love express to us, to us, and through us to the world? And that's part of this battery message that God wants to bring into our lives for this season and for this series and throughout 2021. Last week we focused on God's presence. The first theme was that centering around experiencing God's deep love and growing in our capacity to sense, know, and encounter God's presence in the people of God. And we're invited to kind of reflect on that question how in 2021 might you and I look? to God to develop new ways for us to practice the presence of God daily. Being attentive to the God moments and the God presence among us every day. Really every minute of every day is a posture that we're seeking to develop. We talked about how the reality of religious systems that have taught us that we have to be good to earn God's love by doing that, those good things, by doing the right thing, then God will be us. And we continue to be invited by God to live out that phrase from Trina's last message in the, in the last Sunday Advent, living loved rather than living to be loved. It's a big shift, but it's one that most of us are trapped in some way because of the overlay of kind of religiosity of Jesus. So as today we shift uh, to the second part of the equation, and again, remember this equation that was on the slide that you last week, the character equation, God forming his presence, plus purity, plus passion, plus purpose, plus posture, equals the glory of God. God's glory being revealed within us because we become glory bearers. The very presence of his glory upon us in the midst of that because he lives within us. And so we focus today on purity. We all know that for purity, and especially in the context of the church, is often primarily been focused on sexual purity. But what we're talking about here in the context of this character, this equation, is much deeper and much broader. This is about being pure in heart. Pure in heart. My heart is pure. My heart has been transformed and changed. In terms of mouth, this is what Jesus said. Matthew 5 8, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It kind of comes back to this thing of the right lenses. Is we want those lenses on so we can actually see God in our life. Because our hearts have been purified, and our agenda is focused around me, what I believe, what I want, what I think, but it's being transformed to engage with what he thinks and what he does and who he is. That transforms and changes our heart. Again, in the Passion Paraphrase, it says it this way What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. Wow. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. This ties with that presence part of the equation and with the clarity focus that we're trying to see, seeing more clearly. But let's look at this more purely, uh, more deeply. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see it with new eyes. Let's just pause. Holy Spirit, this morning, we know you're here, we know you live within us, and we invite you to come and to give us new eyes to see at a deeper level understand this whole way of purity, of the stripping away of our agenda and our fears, and the forming of the very, very nature of Christ within us. Do your work among us today, 
right now, throughout this day and throughout this week and beyond, with revelation and the ability to see the details. As we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. A simple way to look at uh, purity is really from this definition, or at least a, a phrase here, understanding and submitting to God's purifying work in our lives as a son of Understanding there is a work that God wants to do in your lives. That's understanding. God actually wants us to go through places of being broken of our agenda. And the only way that really happens is as you submit to God and process that. Other than that, we're going to hate the tough times and be mad at God. And we're going to not submit because we're mad. And we're actually not going to be growing and shaped in the image itself. Again, back to that phrase from a couple of Sundays ago, living love rather than living to be loved means that that frees us when we understand that love. It frees us to submit to God's purifying work in our lives. It all starts when God's wonderful love for us is revealed. When we're in God's presence and we understand, wow, this is a good place to be. This is a God place to be. And in that, I'm freed up to become who Christ has called me to be. Last week, I projected this slide. This is the way of kind of keeping it in front of us. This love theme. Look, John, 1 John 3, 1, 1 and 2, again, from the Passion Paraphrase. Look, look what wonder, look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world is, doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. Beloved, we are God's children right now. However, it is not yet apparent what we will become, but we do know that when it is finally visible, we will be just like him. For we will see him. We will see him as he truly is. For as long as we're in this earth, these are not going to quite be 2020. We don't have the capacity all the time in every situation. To see clearly what's there. And that's part of God continuing to purify our hearts, to be purified from the very inside out. The reality is that the great love of God is also sent to a place where we are safe. You see, when you know you're loved without doubt, without question, you know you're in a place of safety even when it feels like everything is in trouble. Right? When you're in a safe place, Think about Jeremy sitting there in reality, two dollars beside him. They're not always perfect, right? At least one of them is green, the other one's not so sure. Um, but in that context, he provided, he was trying to find a place to save It doesn't mean it's always easy, but it's a part of the journey of formation for all people. God, at an even greater level, provides a place to save you. And we're in that place of knowing that we are loved, and from that place of knowing, we are now in a place where we can truly face our sinfulness, our ugliness, the place that we don't like about ourselves, and not be afraid of God. If we're not going to measure ourselves as long as we diminish, His love is constant, always at the top of the bar. And He wants us to be invited to that place of knowing that love, because if we don't know that, then we're going to run from the scale. And we're going to run angry, shaking our fists at God when things don't go the way we want them to. Remember again from John 3 17, Jesus did not come to the world to judge and condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that brings us to the very heart of this message on purity. Yes, it is understanding and submitting to God's purified work in our lives as the sons and daughters. But it is, it is at an even deeper level. It is allowing our sinful nature to be transformed, to be broken in all of us. We can say it this way in the context of purity. Purity is formed in us when we have been broken. 
and true nobleness is the absence of my identity, of your identity. You see, we all have an agenda. Whenever there is conflict between two persons, there is an agenda on both sides. Sometimes one is a little more mature or refined or on the journey, but there's still an agenda. And in that context, we have to understand that purity is a refining process that God does in our hearts. He loves us so much that he won't let us stay at that place of anger, of resistance, of agenda. Instead, he loves us so much that he brings us into a place a process. I say a process is another place because it's a process that means it's again and again and again and again. In the refining process that God does in our hearts, He allows us to see our sin and brokenness as we truly are broken before the Lord. And in that place of safety and love, where we can be real, our agenda is brought to the surface and skimmed away by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's kind of like the dross in the purifying events. Now, in metallurgy, dross is defined as the scum or unwanted material that forms on the surface of the molten uh, metal. This is what God does with our lives. Our agenda, our fears, He brings heat and pressure and trials and tension and bubbles and bubbles. And you know what comes to the top? The dross, the yuck, the ovens. It's the purifying work. And then the metal work. The one who loves us so much takes his skimmer and skims it away. The dross would never come to the surface without the heat. It would stay hidden, it would stay bonded to other places in the metal, and you never get out without the heat. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most powerful parts of understanding and transforming the work of the Spirit is that it is about. The Lord turned out the heat, using circumstances around us to actually bring out our agenda. And in that, letting it come to the surface because He loves us so much. And it requires me, using this flame here as an example, he, it requires me, a little bit long right there, not too bad, it requires me to, uh, to submit to and stay in that place. Where I say, Lord, whatever it is you want to do, it's just He. I want what He wants in my life more than I want what I want. The other definition, interestingly enough, of, of, of dross in the context of the dictionary is waste or foreign matter, and then bracketed after it was impure. Interesting. Right from the dictionary, waste. Or foreign matter, impure. You know why as human beings, brothers and sisters, none of us can point a finger at the other person and say, You got impurity in your life, I don't. It's called judgment and it's called pride. We're instead responsible to say, Lord, regularly, daily, wherever it is, I come to the flame of the Spirit and I invite you to try to keep in whatever way you choose because I don't want to be transformed. In the image of your son, even when it means what it feels like death to me. Because that's what Jesus did for us. He was willing to do the better and not the best. One of the biggest challenges as human beings is that we are often blind to the areas where we have to We just are. Some of it because it's shut down, it's worried, we're afraid, but often we're just not aware. Sometimes we need to ask others and God to help us see. We don't see because we are blind by our fears and our pain, and in this regard, I encourage you to consider somehow in 2021 to begin developing some new tools, phrases, heart commitments that regularly you come before God. One is to ask a close friend, I really want to hear heart. And are there places in my life where you see that my agenda, my agenda is present? I give you permission to pause. It's hard. But I believe that 
kind of posture is a space and place for all. Something changes to me inside. But you might want to ask God the same question and stop and listen to what he's saying. The psalmist says this in the dissolved lament after sitting with Bathsheba in Psalm 51. Here from the end of verse 3, in me a pure heart, O God, treat me a pure heart. And renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. You see, there's a willingness to be formed and shaped by God. If we really want to grow with God, if we really want to be the church, we want to really want to with God and with one another to create something new, it's going to require a new surrender, a new. I'm not going to get stuck on my pet issues and my things that I think I want to make sure about that I don't like. I don't care what you like or not. At the end of the day, what matters is what does God think about this? And what is the posture of my heart that is inviting me to? Not what is he inviting us to? I'm going to tell anybody else what it is without having a transform or change in my heart. Might we use this prayer? Again, I'm giving tons of science here.
said, how does this even make sense? How many of you consider it pure joy when you face trials and your thoughts? It's kind of silence also. Suddenly two brothers over my right here both raised their hands. I'm kind of shocked that they were willing to in that context. They raised their hands, and I found out later that they were Turkish background believers, now living in Bulgaria, but they were from Muslim, Muslim, uh, from Muslim faith. And I said, you do? Yes. I said, why? The one brother, I think in that context, one of them was sharing that they were saying there with tears in his face, he said, you know what? Whenever I have a trial, it drives me closer to Jesus. And then I understand why he has. Because in that place, I need to rely on him. And for him, at times, it's probably his life and death. So the stakes are a little higher. But why would it make any difference if the stakes somehow are lower? Because I don't think they ever are lower. It's just Consider it pure joy. And why? James says, because the testing of your faith, the heating up of your faith in the midst of the difficult times, brings to the surface the dross so that the Lord can see it all. And can continue to do that purifying work in our lives. The testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish your work so that you can do the Sure, not lacking anything. In that passage, again, from the Passion Translation, Passion Paraphrase, it says, My fellow believers, when seeing this is though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. For you know that when, you, when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure. And then as your first grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. That is God's intention for us as Christ's followers, as disciples of Jesus, is that ongoing, purifying, perfecting. We don't arrive because we got baptized, or arrive because we find out to teach sense of God, or arrive because we preach a sermon, or arrive because we became a bishop. This bishop has to arrive. He is very much in the process of our continual transforming change from the inside out, as recently as this last week, in the ways in which I try to process all of that. A lot of stuff boiling up inside. I don't know what to do, God. Can you be a us in the midst of what I am walking through with you all? And James says, pray for wisdom. Wisdom from God will allow you to see the right spots in the places that God is true. So pray for wisdom. Ask God for that wisdom. He closes in verse 12 and says, Blessed is the man or woman who perseveres under trial. Because when that person has stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God promised to those who love him. When I think back to formational things in my life, and I've probably shared this here before, and Another context, and not to say a whole lot, but there was a seven year stretch in our family where Ben and I faced incredible challenges with our oldest daughter. Where we didn't understand it, it was a lot of depression and other things going on, and we didn't understand the point, prayed hard, went to the council, did all that we had to do. And it was incredibly difficult, the seven, in a sense, worst years of my life. But Ben and I are incredibly different. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, and I wouldn't trade it. Because it has shaped and formed the way that we live our lives. Full of faith, full of hope, and recognition that God is the one who does the work in any of us. Including our first and foremost of ourselves, and including those around us. Trials and difficulties are places where we have broken our agenda, our own agenda. And they become the places where pure hearts, where purity is born in our lives. We want to run away from those things, crying out to God to get rid of them, but they can and will be used by God to transform us if we will own this way. So that's the key to the equation. If we don't surrender, if we're not willing to let God do that work, we're going to stay hard, angry, frustrated with our agenda. And nobody Lights can be that place of fire. 
And so we have revelation, see with God's eyesight, with God's clarity, that that is the place where we transform us and change our lives. Here at the end of this message, I just uh, want you to silently reflect on a couple of possible ways to apply this. I invite the worship team to come forward. And uh, just for a few moments, I'm going to open with prayer and invite us to, uh, to ponder these just briefly. Choose one of these areas to put on your glasses and clarity to allow God to begin to serve. And after a few moments, I'll just uh, turn to each uh, I'm going to pray now, and then you can uh, have some music playing, and then uh, after it, invite us to join in the closing song. God, we today want to hear your Bible in our lives. We acknowledge that we don't like pain, we don't like the struggle. And we don't even really understand what all is happening in this, but we recognize that there is something about this process of your life that we need new revelation, new learning, new application, so that we, with you, and the body here at feet, can together create something new. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.
is 1034. We are going to start our Connect Gathering at 1045 this morning. So feel free to get up, stretch your legs, chat, catch up, so you can see each other well. Use the bathroom, and we are going to meet for our Connect Gathering back here at 1045. Thank you so much for worshiping. 